Good morning, and welcome to Terminal 5 Administrative Building. I'm Kristen Ng, Commission President of the Port of Tacoma and co-chair of the Northwest Seaport Alliance, a marine cargo partnership between the Port of Tacoma and Port of Seattle. We are glad to have our partners from the Puget Sound Maritime Forum join us as we release our most recent air emissions from the air emissions inventory results today. The Puget Sound Maritime Air Forum is a voluntary association of private and public maritime organizations, including port, air agencies, and environmental and public health advocacy groups, with operational or regu regulatory responsibilities related to the maritime industry. Together, we are committed to accurately quantifying and voluntarily reducing air emissions associated with maritime transportation. Back in 2005, the forum conducted our first maritime air emissions inventory to provide scientifically valid data to improve the understanding of the nature, location, and magnitude of emissions for maritime related operations. We've since completed three more inventories in 2011, 2016, and 2021. The work is important because the inventory results help guide and focus future emission reduction investments. The Port of Tacoma, Port of Seattle, and the Northwest Seaport Alliance have made commitment to reduce maritime emissions to zero for scope one and two emissions by 2040. These are emissions that are under the port's direct control and scope three emissions by 2050, or before, I'd like to say. These are emissions across the wider maritime community. Uh, we recognize that this is an ambitious goal requiring significant financial investment, industry outreach, and technological advancement. We also know that this requires intense collaboration between many stakeholders from labor, industry, tribes, environment, and our community. Uh, I like to say that you'll probably hear that the emissions have gone down dr drastically since 2005, and even from uh, five years ago to 2021. But I must say, focus on the present, because we are making major investments in carbon reductions with our partners. And this is due to the Inflation Reduction Act, Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, Climate Commitment Act, and our works with, ag with agencies like the Puget Sound Clear Clean Air Agency with regards to our climate reduction pollution grants, or the US EPA Clean Ports grants, which we just submitted a $500 million, half a billion, to transition our cargo handling equipment to zero emissions and to install shore power in all of our international container terminals by 2030. So we are making the major investments today so that when we have this press conference in 10 years, you will see the results. Um, so I'll just say like, these people will likely tell you the results of the emission inventories and speak to the successes of the things that we have done in the past whether that is the clean trucks program or installing particularly shore power on certain terminals. Uh, you will also hear from our ports, followed by an expert panel that will, highlight, that will highlight inventory results, speak to the investments we've made to date, and discuss what comes next to further uh, maritime reduction on our emissions. Now to share more about our emissions inventory, I will pass the mic to my colleague, Commissioner Fred Fellerman with the Port of Seattle. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris, and I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to be working with her at the Seaport Alliance, a great uh, champion at the Port of Tacoma, at current president and co-chair of the Alliance. I'm Port of Seattle Commissioner Fred Fellerman, and I'm serving my third term, so I'm the old, old dog on the block right now, as the color of the hair reflects. And I think um, one of the things that um, uh, Commissioner Ang just uh, pointed out, that, uh, that, that the, really the theme of of today's presentation is that you know, we're on a roll. This is, you ain't seen nothing yet. There are significant reductions going on, but um, what's, what's in front of us is really what's most exciting to me. This current five years uh, summary that you'll hear about in more detail is pretty anomalous. You know, we had this little thing called the pandemic in between you might have heard of. And so things really were, were odd, whether it be the cruise ship shutting down in 2020, ships sitting at anchor, idling away. Um, so. The numbers are important not to hide, but you have to be able to, you know, qualify what it is that you're what you're looking at, and um, so and also 
looking from 2015 or, or two, yeah, 2015 is, um, is important to, you know, the caveat, um, well, actually we started 2000, yeah. It, the caveat that also, you know, we had things like the North America ECA come in, the emission control area, where we had significant reductions in the, in the uh, fuel sulfur quantities, and that was Pacific wide. So when, if you look at the graphs, I mean, we have a huge dip that was something that we can take some credit for because we actively lobbied for it, but it was something that was uh, upon us that really made a, the first huge dip. And then in uh, 2019, though, is when I think was when you really can see something that the Seaport Alliance with the guidance and leadership of the commission, of course, that um, with the clean truck program, where we made some su substantive uh, reductions in the uh, diesel particulate matter. Um, but, you know, the greenhouse gas emissions are still lagging a little bit because we're still burning fossil fuels and we're improving the, the, the cargo handling equipment to get to tier three to tier four EPA standards where before they were tier zero because they were offshore, offshore, off-road vehicles. These things are improving, but, you know, we're, we're going to have you know, greener trucks, we're, you know, electric trucks, we're going to have electric cargo handling equipment, we'll have fuel cells. It's, and, and as uh, Commissioner Ang also said, the grant opportunities that we seized, both the Seattle and Tacoma ports hired our additional staff just to chase after this grant money, and we've been enormously successful. So, and I, we cannot underscore enough, and it's not politics, if it wasn't for our legislators in the, in the state and in Congress, this would not be possible. Our optimism for the future, these are enormously expensive undertakings. And so, you know, having Senator Murray as the chair of appropriations and Senator Kenwell as the chair of Commerce Committee, we have the Climate Commitment Act at the state level and the clean fuel standard. This stuff would have, there's no way, I mean, you will see coming up. I think it's particularly appropriate. We're meeting here at T5. Two uh, shore power terminals are, are in a, you know, two, two of our terminals. You won't see this in this inventory. Next five years, this will be coming up. This is our first international cargo terminal to have shore power. Middle of this season, we're gonna have a Terminal 66 uh, for the cruise ship. This will mean all three of our cruise terminals are gonna be electrified and uh, commissions <laughs> continues to uh, uh, articulate our goals for advancing, accelerating our greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. And you will see that, um, in fact, next commission meeting, you'll see that w once we have all that shore power connected, um, we're going to see that people make use of it. So, uh, and it's because of the leadership of the industry and our government partners that um, we're able to achieve this. This was a voluntary initiative. You know, Mike Moore, I was outside the commission, but I was there since the first in, uh, inventory started. And uh, thank you for the leadership and the progress we continue to make. So with that, I have the Port of Everett Commissioner to join us. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Uh yeah, Commissioner Fellman. Uh, uh, good morning, and I'm Glenn Bachman, uh, Port of Everett Commission Secretary. Just a quick um, a personal note, uh, this used to be my playground. I was born and raised up on the hill here in the area, back when um, uh, uh, the steel mill was operating, Bethlehem Steel. And uh, I know that TSA would go apoplectic if they saw me riding my bicycle down uh, right on the edge of the port to, to the banana boats and pick up uh, score bananas from the guys shipping them off and north. But we did it. Yeah, there was no TSA at the time. So um, I'm honored to be here. And, and uh, thank you very much for to uh, highlight uh, the great success of the uh, maritime industry. We're here today because of the collaboration and efforts and uh, creative um, forwarding, uh, forward thinking of the Puget Sound port industry leaders, organizations, and regulatory agencies. Um, air, <coughs> as Commissioner Ang uh, pointed out and Commissioner Fellerman uh, mentioned, our efforts are working to improve air quality uh, at our ports and keep Puget Sound in a clean air attainment. 
At the Port of Everett, especially, 2021 uh, inventory results found that our port seaport decreased, uh, of, decreased emissions of EPA criteria uh, pollutions by more than 34% average. This is 2016 to 21, and this is on a per metric ton basis, but still a significant number. The, um, uh, again, the uh, Port of Everett has uh, been uh, uh, leaning in very uh, sharply and very excited to be a part of the, the whole effort for the Puget Sound region. And um, it, this is a reduction uh, in, uh, uh, is a, this reduction is a, a culmination of efforts made by the, the Port of Everett to enhance our area, area air quality and environment uh, as a core strategic value of our organization. We achieved these results through thoughtful and significant investments in cleaner technology, cleaner fuels, cranes, vessels, trucks, and more efficient operating systems. Overall, the past decade, uh, the, uh, the Port of Everett has invested more than $150 million you know, to modernize and green its seaport facilities while expanding our capabilities to support global trade. These efforts include upgrades uh, on our docks, increasing rail capacity, adding cleaner cargo handling equipment, prioritize um, uh, sustainable features to help green and supply the green the supply chain. In 2021, uh, the port opened its modernized south terminal. The $57 million upgrade uh, was added another full service berth uh, in the Everett with two electric post Panamax cranes. Uh, these will be able to handle um, larger uh, vessels and uh, heavier cargo. And in 2022, we completed a 40-acre, $40 million investment to open the uh, modern Norton Terminal. It's the first new cargo terminal to open in the U.S. Uh, West Coast uh, in more than a decade, uh, adding critical capacity uh, to the global supply chain. Both of these critical upgrades added infrastructure to support future shore power at the docks, and we look forward to ships plugging in here very soon once the industry standards are set for us. By taking part in these important air, air shed inventories, not only do we get to see the collectively our efforts are working, but we also get the measurements and baseline data necessary to continue pushing the envelope and improve on the, our successes. And as I understand it, we get to see it quite often in, in real time. So we use this data to see uh, our opportunities lie, where our opportunities lie, whether that's uh, updating or creating new uh, policies, implementing new procedures, or making responsible choices when considering upgrades to equipment infrastructure. As we continue to plan uh, for environmentally responsible growth, we look forward to partnering with the ports of Seattle, Tacoma, Northwest Seaport Alliance, and the maritime industry to continue to set the bar for clean port operations in the future. Thank you. Thanks to all of the uh, all three commissioners <clears throat> for that introduction. Um, uh, my name is Steve Nicholas. I lead the Air Quality and Sustainable Practices Program and Team for the Northwest Seaport Alliance and the Port of Tacoma, uh, and I have the honor of um, uh, moderating this panel discussion during which we we'll kind of dig into uh, dig into some more of the details around this uh, updated emissions inventory, and then and then uh, also um, respond to uh, questions in the room. Um, you know the old adage, what gets uh, measured gets managed, and that really is what this uh, emissions inventory I is all about. Um, this is the main way through which um, the, the maritime partners that are represented here uh, track our collective progress over time in terms of driving down and ultimately eliminating the air and climate pollution associated with um, our activities. That's kind of really 
what this is all about. Um, it's a super important study. We do it about every five years, as you've heard. Um, and uh, we're going to dig into some of the details here. I think uh, I very much agree with Commissioner Fellerman and others that we really are on a roll. Of course, I'm going to be biased in saying that. At the same time, there's no question uh, in my mind when you look at these results that um, we need to keep our nose to the grindstone, right? There's work uh, still to do. 82% uh, reduction in diesel particulate matter, that's pretty damn good. But the only appropriate uh, goal for diesel is zero, and you'll hear about that from Kathy Strange. Um, Greenhouse gases, a lot of work to do, right? 10% reduction is decent, but not nearly what, um, you know, uh, we, we need to do to get to zero by 2050 or sooner, which is our goal. So uh, on a roll, a lot to be proud of, nose to the grindstone, a lot more work to do. Fortunately, we have an incredible brain trust to dig into some of these details and to respond to some of the questions that you might have around the room. Um, we've got three people representing ports. We've got um, my colleague, Ryan Child, who's an environmental program manager for the Port of Seattle. Um, we've got, um, uh, we've got uh, Eric Gerking, who's the chief of, plan, uh, of environmental programs at the Port of uh, Everett, and then my, my teammate, Rose Arsers, who's an environmental program manager with the Northwest Seaport Alliance and the Port of Tacoma. So we've actually got four port entities um, represented on the panel. Um, we've got Captain Mike Moore from the Pacific Merchant Shipping Association uh, and a really important organization, really important partner representing, as you'll hear from uh, Captain Mike, uh, ocean carriers and marine terminal operators who, as you can imagine, are some of the absolute key players when we're talking about um, uh, eliminating uh, port-related, maritime-related climate and, uh, and, and air pollution and, and decarbonizing our activities. And then we've got Kathy Strange, who is the Director of Air Quality Programs at the Puget Sound Air Quality um, Agency. Um, and so quite the brain trust. Um, I'm going to take the liberty of posing a question or two or three uh, to them and inviting them to respond, and then we'll um, <clears throat> we'll open it up for questions, so get those questions ready. You probably already have them ready. Um, the first question uh, would love, to, and I'm going to ask each of the panelists to address this, but to do it super succinctly in the interest of time. Um, talk about one or two things that, you, from your perspective, from your organization, you're the most proud of when you look at the results of this updated inventory, and then maybe one or two things that um, you wish had gone better or that you're looking to uh, improve upon uh, in, the, in, the, in the coming years. Um, Anybody, any volunteers, or who wants to begin? All right, Mike, Captain Mike, you're on. Use the mic, or we, we're um, we can yes, please. Use the mic. Is it on? Mic on, mic. It's on. It's on. Okay, great. Uh, my first rodeo. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's really it's really important to recognize a couple of things that have already been mentioned. There's voluntary and mandatory. Voluntary preceded mandatory. Voluntary measures are still in place as we uh, develop standards. Uh, this really goes back to the late 90s and early 2000s. In fact, 2003 is when we decided we had to do an emissions inventory because we didn't have good data and you can't manage it, you don't measure, you already heard that. Uh, and we needed the collaboration between public and private interests. So the port authorities representing the public side and agencies and so forth and then uh, our members representing industry on the ocean carrier side and the marine terminal side. And so you take a look at what are the things we can do, what are the easy uh, things to uh, implement uh, right away. And the first thing was cleaner fuels in diesel generators at the berth, closest to people's lungs, while we continued to develop and push and lobby for uh, the, the United States to become signatory to what's called MARPOL Annex 6 at the International Maritime Organization. And once you did that, it opened the door to create what at that time were called sulfur emission control areas, but broadened out uh, soon thereafter into emission control areas, and we have that, and that's a very important part of the, of the reduction of emissions from ships for sure. But it doesn't mean you stop on the voluntary measures, and I think the thing I'm most proud of is that we got together to do this emissions inventory voluntarily, donated money, but, uh, you know, put our heads together to see um, how comprehensive an emissions inventory we could have. I, I would posit to say that we probably had the most comprehensive emissions inventory in 2005. Uh, you know, yeah, it was released in 2007, but it was 2005 activity year. Starcrest was our consultant. We worked closely with them. All the entities got together, uh, and we developed a, a big airshed, comprehensive look at things. And, and we're kind of unique in that regard. It's 147 nautical miles from sea to the Port of Tacoma and 147 miles back out. This is not LA Long Beach, 
where you come right from ocean, break water, and get into the terminals right away. So we wanted to take a look at that whole air basin, have a real comprehensive look. That was accomplished, and now we're on our fourth one. And you can see the marked progress we have. Uh, the challenges are technology doesn't develop as fast as we'd like, and so uh, you have ocean carriers going, hey, I'm going to build new ships. I'm going to have better hull coatings. I'm going to have improved propeller design. I'm doing all these things, and I'm going to make it dual fuel capable because we don't know on our port call rotations which fuels are going to be available. So yeah, you have cleaner diesel and you have LNG, but then you have these question marks out there about methanol and ammonia uh, and uh, hydrogen and so on. What's really going to end up be, uh, developing? I think that the challenge is, uh, for our folks anyway, is to figure out ahead of time how to invest um, uh, their dollars best to um, fit into what the future is going to hold. And that means infrastructure and, and new fuel types have to come online in the port call rotations that they have. Last thing I'd say, I'd, I'd, I, I don't think anybody could have envisioned in the 80s or 90s or when container, containerization in the 60s was developed, ships the size we're seeing now. The biggest ship in the world, uh, container ship in the world in 1995 was 5,280 20-foot containers. And now we're up to 24,000. Um, to put that in perspective, if you offload a 24,000 TU vessel, you'd put them on the, the back of trucks and have safe following distance, and you'd go about 500 miles past Bo Boise from here. So think about that from one ship. We don't have 24,000 call in here, but we have had 18,000 call here. These are really big ships, economy of scale, less overall emissions footprint per container, in addition to the things about new fuels and so forth. I know that wasn't succinct, but that's what you got. It was pretty, it was pretty succinct given all the bases <laughs> that you covered, Captain Mike. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, I'm, I'm glad that you volunteered first because that was a terrific, uh, a terrific overview. Let's hear from the ports now, though. I'm going to ask Rose first and then Ryan and Eric to chime in uh, from the ports perspective, um, things you're proud of, uh, challenges you see looking ahead. So uh, one of the, the biggest accomplishments I think is worth mentioning is the significant reduction in diesel particulate matter emissions. Um, it was 82% from our baseline uh, 2005 inventory and then a 30% decrease from our 2016 inventory. And this is largely due to the Northwest Seaport Alliance uh, clean truck program that was implemented in 2019. The clean truck program requires that all trucks serving our international container terminals have a 2007 or newer engine, which offers an estimated reduction in diesel particulate matter by up to 90% per truck. So that's where we, we really saw those, those DPM reductions. Um, we're also really excited about the successful deployment of six battery electric yard tractors in our south intermodal yard in Tacoma. Um, this project was a really first step in demonstrating the viability of zero emission technology um, to, for terminal operations in our gateway. And so we really look forward to continuing that momentum with future deployments in partnership with our terminal operators. Um, and then lastly, we saw a large number of clean, cleaner Tier 4 cargo hailing equipment, uh, which can be attributed to lease language that was added in 2018, which requires any new diesel cargo hailing equipment deployed at our terminals to, to be, be Tier 4 or newer. Um, and those for, who are not familiar with those terminologies, um, Tier 4 is the cleanest possible diesel engine by EPA emission standards. Thanks, Rose. Those are great examples. Ryan? Um, yeah, I'm Ryan Child. I'm with Port of Seattle. And when uh, when we talk about Port of Seattle's emissions in the inventory, we have uh, the Northwest Seaport Alliance operates the marine cargo terminals in both Seattle and Tacoma. So Port of Seattle's emissions profile that I'll talk about actually includes our three cruise berths, as well as commercial fishing and harbor vessels uh, at our terminals and properties. Recreational vessels, uh, we have the grain terminal at Terminal 86 and some rail locomotives there, as well as grain ships, um, and then uh, cargo handling equipment on uh, our terminals operated by Port of Seattle. So that doesn't include cargo handling equipment that like moves containers. So um, we have a little bit different emissions profile there. And 2021, it, it's sort of a hard year for Port of Seattle to really speak to a long-term durable trend. So we did see reduced greenhouse gas and uh, diesel particulate matter emissions and um, sort of across all the air, air pollutants, we saw a reduction from both 2005 as well as from the last inventory in 2016. 
Um, but it also was a different year for our operations. So we had about 50% uh, reduced cruise operations. Over 2020, the cruise season was completely canceled with COVID. It returned in 2021, but we had a smaller season where cruise wasn't able to get up and running until about July. And then because it was the return for COVID, we just had much fewer cruise calls than normal. So um, ocean going vessels are our largest source of emissions and cruise ships in particular are really our largest uh, source of both greenhouse gas and diesel emissions. So that really impacted the trend that we're seeing. And um, it's hard to tell you know, if, if that reduction, uh, a lot of it is really due to that reduction in operations. Um, but I think one of the things that I am proud of is um, in this inventory, we actually did improve some of our data collection and our methodology to really fill some data gaps um, with collecting more information about vehicles that are accessing our terminals, trucks that are provisioning the cruise terminals. We were able to collect um, some additional data from, from terminal logs uh, to fill those gaps. So I think we really have a more accurate picture of emissions with this inventory. Um, and we are also able to use uh, automatic information system data for ocean-going vessels, um, which looks at real-time vessel location and travel. So um, that's one of the things that I'm most proud of is just I think we're getting a more accurate picture of emissions that, that we can really use to build our programs from. Um, and then I think where uh, you know we're looking at improving in the future is really that reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. We're not seeing those really deep reductions that we need to see to achieve our goals. And so I think that's where we're really targeting in the future. You know, all most maritime operations are still f uh, running on fossil fuels. And so many of our programs are focused on how we can facilitate uh, the transition to sustainable maritime fuels and electrification of our terminals in, uh, moving forward. Thanks, Ryan. Eric? Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Gerken. I'm with the Port of Everett. And um, just kind of scoping back a little bit, um, like to make some general statements. And, uh, you know, I, I just think that our industry should be really proud of its leadership. Um, there's been a sea change, no pun intended, uh, within the port and maritime industry since the last inventory. Uh, the awareness and recognition of climate issues is just very broad at this point. And um, there are meaningful steps across our industry uh, uh, being made uh, to reduce emissions, um, you know, from climate plans to uh, zero emissions cargo handling technologies becoming more available, and uh, critically, uh, substantial funding uh, to deploy these technologies is becoming available, as, as we've heard so far. Um, in terms of uh, the Port of Everett and what we've accomplished, um, just over the past decade, we've been very focused on a comprehensive uh, plan across the entire waterfront to uh, clean up and restore the environment, modernize our facilities, and uh, create thousands of family wage jobs along the way. Uh, some of those projects uh, Commissioner Bachman mentioned. Uh, but specifically, um, uh, we are proud of the progress that we've made in these uh, emissions efforts. Um, specifically, uh, we developed and are now implementing our 2020 climate strategy, um, which aims to reduce our CO2 emissions um, using multiple uh, fronts. And uh, also, it's designed to address local climate impacts that we'll be seeing in the future. Um, the Port of Everett, as Commissioner Bachman mentioned, we moved cargo more efficiently um, over the, uh, between the, the last two uh, reports. And um, that's highlighted in our uh, carbon dioxide emissions, which um, showed a reduction of 34%, uh, if you look at it from a uh, per metric ton basis. Um, and uh, notably, uh, we are very proud uh, to have served uh, our communities during the supply chain crisis, which if you see our results, you'll notice that we have a major spike in the amount of uh, cargo that we handled between 2016 and 2021. In fact, it was uh, 300, approximately 300% 300 more cargo between those periods. And, um, but despite uh, that increase um, being so high, we still represent you know, approximately 6% of the total uh, Puget Sound port um, uh, emissions. Uh, so we're still a pretty small fish in the bay. Um, and if we are successful with our EPA grant, uh, uh, we will be able to decrease our overall CO2 emissions by, f by 40% uh, within the next three to five years. So I think we, we can be proud of our efficiencies that we've gained. Uh, we've deployed uh, more modern uh, cargo handling equipment with Tier 4 
uh, uh, motors, and um, that's that's showing up in our results. Also, our uh, operational uh, efficiencies have been made um, to also just become more efficient. Um, our uh, We've brought on uh, some new facilities, South Terminal being one. We invested $57 million, uh, to strengthen the wharf and, and add new uh, uh, gantry cranes, electric gantry cranes, which can handle heavier, larger cargo more efficiently with uh, fewer emissions. Um, but going forward, we are going to be uh, focused on re uh, reducing our uh, carbon dioxide uh, and uh, the other emissions uh, associated with our operation. And um, we plan to deploy uh, uh, new technologies um, in order to address that. And so we're hopeful uh, with our EPA grant that uh, we'll be successful in that application and, and we'll be able to deploy those technologies. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy, what's the perspective of the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency when you look at these emission inventory results uh, in terms of things you, you think we're, we should be proud of as a region and, and, and some of the areas for improvement from your point of view? <laughs> All right. Um, so, oh, you threw off my questions. <laughs> What's going on? Um, so, we've made great progress, obviously, and Rose already highlighted the diesel particulate matter reduction. So, that is great to see, and we still have work to do. I will echo. We recently completed an EPA air toxics monitoring study, another way of measuring our air pollution, and it confirmed what we know. Um, despite amazing reductions, it still represents far and away, it being diesel particulate matter, the greatest risk uh, for potential cancer risk from air pollution in our region. So it was over 80% of the potential cancer risk. So as Steve said, really the only right level of diesel particulate matter is, is zero. Um, so we need to keep moving. And then also following on the theme of keeping the ball rolling, um, the greenhouse gas emissions is going to be a more difficult challenge. It's a tougher nut to crack than some of the other sulfur, diesel, other criteria pollutant emission reductions uh, with the entire transition of technology and fuels. So um, everybody's already mentioned some great potential funding sources. So just leveraging these as much as possible, full steam ahead. And um, I will mention as well, um, for the Clean Air Agency, this work really touches on three of our top priorities. Those priorities being really ambitious targets for greenhouse gas emission reduction to address climate change. Uh, the second one I already mentioned, addressing diesel particulate matter because of its toxicity. And the third one, really a focus in our overburdened communities. So these are our communities that are facing cumulative impacts. So this work is really vital and the partnerships have been amazing and we're proud to have been a part of it uh, since the beginning. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Um, I'm going to pose one more question to the panel, uh, kind of another two-part question, and then we're going to, um, you know, open it up. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I'd like to ask, um, and I think I'd like each panelist to um, address this one as well. Um, talk about, so that was kind of a good look back, um, uh, and I think now maybe digging a little deeper as we look ahead um, at, the, at least the next five years before we do the next emissions inventory and beyond. Um, talk about one or two of your organizations uh, top priorities as it relates to uh, reducing and moving toward elimination of air and climate pollution from our activities. Um, and then um, talk about what you think is, is, uh, is, is the biggest challenge from your organization's perspective in terms of achieving that goal of zero emissions by 2050 or sooner. Um, Captain Mike, you want to go first again? Sure. Well, there's plenty of challenges out there. Of course, we've had a lot of successes, but uh, again, the biggest challenge in my mind is picking the winners in this, uh, uh, on the o ocean carrier side, the fuel type, right? So that you have the infrastructure, infrastructure has to get developed so you can go bunker, you can refuel uh, in the port call uh, rotations that you select. I do want to mention, um, the word efficiency has come up a couple of times. I do want to mention there are still things at the edges that matter. Mm -hmm. And so during the supply chain crisis, when we had 14 container ships at anchor in our anchorages here, and we had 43 at anchor in LA Long Beach, container ships are not built to sit there. Uh, they they're built to move cargo. So this is not an ideal situation. And we met with citizens and so forth uh, around the area that were complaining about the, the ships at anchor. Well, we made a change, right? So we just talked with our marine terminals and said, let's not queue the vessels up for berth slots at Port Angeles, where the pilot station is. Let's queue you before you leave Asia. And, and, and in doing that, I also was a chairman of a, a, a group that runs a, a traffic uh, management sort of a system through the Aleutian Islands and the Great Circle Route. They were able to slow down, slow down, manage their voyage, 
uh, optimize your voyage, reduce emissions, reduce fuel use, and then avoid anchoring here, which, which eliminates a whole transit. Instead of going to anchor and then getting a pilot to go from anchor to the dock and then dock back out to sea, you eliminate, eliminate uh, the time at anchorage and so forth. So I wouldn't want to underestimate the value of operational efficiencies that, that you can squeeze out of the system. A percent here, three percent there, four percent there all adds up while this technology and infrastructure is catching up. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I think I think you know one of our challenges is our guys are building ships pretty rapidly. If you look at the new ship build, it used to take three years to get in the queue to build a ship. These things are being built pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, they're trying to figure out how to properly optimize the deployment of those vessels. And again, you just don't know what the port call rotation, um, you know, refueling opportunities are going to be. So in the meantime, you got it. We we on the ocean carrier side have to optimize uh, the vessel operations. And that means uh, sea speeds used to go 25 knots. They reduce those down to 21 on when they're designing these vessels. And here's a really important factor: if you reduce speed 20 percent at that level, you, you uh, save 40 percent fuel. So those are big, big reductions. Those things have taken place. Leverage the economy of scale as we're marching towards those new fuel types on the terminal side. Obviously, they have to work through the leases and with the port authorities to figure out how to, uh, you know, uh, turn over the cargo handling equipment to cleaner and cleaner equipment. They either own the equipment or they lease the equipment or they're in some kind of a combination uh, with, the, with the port authorities up and down the coast on how to do that. That's happening as well. Uh, in addition, I think it's, um, if you go back when first electrification happened, there were no standards. How are you going to plug in? Uh, how's this going to happen? Uh, where's the electricity going to come from? I think a lot of those questions were out there 15, 20 years ago, and as we're going through the process, you have more standards coming out. So ship being constructed can have the right, right setup. So when they go to a port that has plug-in capability, they're able to do so. So I think a lot, there's a lot of moving parts still out there. It still takes voluntary measures, still takes leaning forward in the saddle, uh, still takes money. Uh, and at some point in time, some, some winner is going to come out there, a couple winners are going to come out there on the fuel types for the vessel side, and I think we'll see them migrate towards that as quickly as they can. Thank you, Captain Mike. Let's hear from the ports. I'm going to switch it up, go in the uh, opposite uh, order and ask Ryan to go first, then Eric, and then uh, Rose. So from the ports perspective, one or two top priorities looking ahead, and uh, you're thinking about uh, one, of the, one or two of the biggest challenges. Ryan? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, I think for us, as I mentioned, uh, ocean-going vessels are sort of our largest portion of emissions. If you sort of look at the pie chart, it's uh, about 60 to, to 75 percent. And so really, if we're um, looking at achieving our greenhouse gas reduction targets of carbon neutral by 2050, we need to address those emissions. Um, and so that's really what we're focused on moving forward. So we, um, since 2021, we actually announced a Green Quarter project, the Pacific Northwest to Alaska Green Quarter, which is focused on cruise, um, studying the feasibility of low and zero emission cruising to Alaska. So we're working closely with the major cruise lines that sail in that market, as well as uh, Vancouver, which is another home port for cruise to Alaska and ports up in Alaska. So working together with the industry on, on how we can find solutions. Um, and we're actually, uh, this year we'll be launching a study looking specifically at green methanol and the feasibility of that in cruise. Um, so in general, looking at um, how we can help facilitate the deployment of new fuels and zero emission fuels like green methanol. Um, and then ocean-going vessels also have emissions at birth. And so as Commissioner Fellman mentioned, um, as of the 2024 cruise season this summer, uh, our shore power project at Pier 66 will be complete. Um, and that will mean that all of our cruise terminals, uh, all of our cruise berths have shore power. And so through that and by increasing the connection rates, working with the cruise lines to make sure that they're connecting and working through our, our berthing agreements, um, we can uh, get more ships connecting and nearly eliminate those emissions from vessels at berth. So those are two areas that we're working on, really addressing those ocean-going vessel emissions. And then um, when we look at sort of overall transition of our terminals and our equipment, we're also this year completing the Seattle waterfront clean energy strategy, which is a collaborative effort where Port of Seattle is working with the Northwest Seaport Alliance, as well as Seattle City Light on just a holistic strategy for um, what's the demand for electricity across our terminals if we're going to transition away from like liquid fossil fuels to electric for electric cargo handling equipment and shore power and planning for that energy demand in the future. So that study is also wrapping up this year. Thank you, Ryan. 
So from the Port of Everett uh, perspective, you know, we're a multi-purpose port. Uh, we handle odd-sized, heavy, uh, uh, mechanized uh, cargo in addition to some containers. And so with that multi-purpose, we need to be very careful in, in deploying uh, new cargo handling technology. We need to make sure it, it works and it's going to uh, be sustainable and resilient and redundant and flexible to handle those different types of cargos. Um, and so we're approaching this as, as being opportunists right now. And so our, uh, while, the, while there's funding uh, coming online, we want to be opportunists and um, start to take on some of these, these items. Um, but we want to do it in a methodical way. Um, on the short range, uh, we have an opportunity where we are going to be electrifying one of our peers. And by doing so, we're going to uh, eliminate the use of 60,000 gallons of diesel uh, that's used every year uh, to support our tenant uh, shipyard uh, as we take them off of, of generators and, and go directly to our uh, Snohomish PUD. Um, and of course, uh, we're focused on uh, the current opportunity with, again, the EPA grant and we're looking at um, electrifying a significant portion of our cargo handling equipment, um, electrifying operation of both of our mobile harbor cranes, and providing ship to shore charging infrastructure for cargo ships that visit the Port of Everett. And if we're successful again, that should reduce our emissions by 40% over the next uh, three to five years. And so it's with this kind of short range plan that we also then need to build upon that and have a medium and longer range plan to continue to uh, uh, reach that uh, those uh, uh, goals of, of net zero. And um, again, key to this transition, we want to bring on these cargos or these uh, cargo handling equipment um, in a way that we get to know the equipment. We provide the workforce training and and confirm that that it's really going to uh, be able to support the diversity of our activities. Um, and so I think a few of the challenges going forward will be kind of along those same lines, proving the technology, um, workforce training, and then one item that I think a lot of us are going to be struggling with, which is um, the ability for our grid to be able to support this electrification. Um, we are, uh, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to be bringing on a portion of our equipment mix and um, that will open up opportunities in the future for different types of alternative fuels, such as hydrogen-powered uh, cargo handling equipment. As, that, uh, as those equipments become more available and hydrogen becomes more available, that may be a nice fit for our overall mix of uh, alternative fuels and, and, and uh, low to zero emissions equipment. So that's, that's kind of what we're doing on the short, medium, and long-range plan. All right, at Northwest Seaport Alliance, uh, we have a shared goal with our home ports uh, to eliminate emissions from our operations by 2050. Uh, so to help meet this target, we also have some short, medium, and long-term goals. And I'll, I'll mostly talk about our short-term goals today because that's where you'll see in our next emissions inventory the biggest change. Um, and so we have committed to reducing emissions from our three largest emission sources, which are ocean-going vessels, trucks, and cargo hand equipment. On the ocean-going vessel side, uh, you've heard a little bit from our commissioners about our robust shore power program. So shore power will be installed at all of our major international container terminals by 2030. Right now, shore power is available at Terminal 5. It will be available at the end of this year at Husky Terminal in uh, the South Harbor. And then we have shore power projects planned for three to four more terminals over the next five years. So that's, that's going to be a significant impact on emissions. Um, and then on the truck side, um, we are working to launch a, an incentive program at the end of this year to help reduce the cost burden of purchasing zero emission drayage trucks. Similarly, on cargo handling equipment, we are launching a sister program, if you will, that also incentivizes the purchase of zero emission cargo handling equipment. And then we're also actively working with our marine terminal operators uh, to facilitate those zero emission cargo handling equipment deployments. Um, it's also worth mentioning on the ocean going vessel side, we are establishing green shipping corridors as well. Um, you heard a little bit of, about that from Ryan. 
Um, so on Northwest Cedar Port Alliance, we are working to, um, we're in the feasibility phase to assess the feasibility of an auto Roro carrier corridor between our gateway and the port of Ulsan in the Republic of Korea. And then on the container ship side, we are developing a corridor also from our gateway to the port of uh, Busan in Republic of Korea. Um, and then for the, the greatest challenge that we face, I mean, our supply chain ecosystem is so complex and there's so many stakeholders. Um, so really it's going to necessitate everyone working together um, and to completely elim eliminate emissions, we will be reliant on the deployment and scalability of zero emission fuel and technology and the subsequent adoption of that from the industry, um, which also means significant investments. To kind of illustrate that point, um, I'll offer an example uh, on the drayage trucking side. Typical truckers, they, they usually buy diesel trucks on the second and third hand market for between thirty dollars and $50,000. One battery electric truck costs roughly $450,000 plus taxes and insurance. And you also have the charging and infrastructure costs. Um, so fortunately, you've heard a lot about grant funding opportunities. And so we are working to take advantage of that to help reduce that cost burden. Thanks, Rose. Kathy, you get to play sweeper again from the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency's point of view. Uh, one or two priorities looking ahead and your take on our biggest challenge. All right, I'll start with challenges. Um, the challenges, it won't surprise people, is just the scope and scale of the challenge and the urgency. Um, mm. We keep hearing um, again and again, whether it's the uh, um, National Climate Assessment or the IPCC, what, what we're looking at in the future, and we're seeing it with our own eyes, uh, the impacts in our, in our region. And so the scope and the scale um, is a challenge, and it's great that we're talking about transportation because it's almost 40% of the entire emissions pie. And of that 40%, uh, the heavy duty is the most difficult uh, to address. So um, all that is encouraging. Uh, one specific, uh, so again, the challenge is just the urgency and the scale. Um, and, and the need to partner, because there's no single entity, private, public, government, that can, that can do this uh, without the partnerships. Um, and then in terms of specific projects that we're taking on, you know, before the next emission, before we find ourselves here again, uh, after the next emission inventory, is uh, the Clean Air Agency is taking a lead role uh, for the Inflation Reduction Act's uh, CPRG, which is the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. So partnering with um, entities like port partners, uh, jurisdictions across our region to ensure that, you know, we've talked a lot about funding, to ensure that we're able to receive the resources we need for the technology, for the logistics changes we need to make to ensure um, cleaner emissions in our region and beyond. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, I've got another question or two in my quiver, but I'm going to pause here uh, and, uh, and open it up to um, the floor, the room. Uh, if there are any uh, questions for our panelists. I'm curious, um, I'm Josh Farley from the Seattle Times Editorial Board. Hello. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about the COVID pandemic obviously turned the, everything upside down and relying on that 2021 data to go forward and, and do when this work happens again, and I presume 2026, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So. What, does, what, what kind of expectations should we have? Obviously, downward trajectory, I think everybody, you, you know, let's say it's something to trumpet, but how, how much should we take stock in that in 2021 as we go towards the, the, the next goal? Are we in for disappointment in 2021? I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I, I think uh, this is the fourth data point. So we got the 2005 activity year, released in 2007, and then of course 2011, 2016, and 2021, you can put an asterisk in there and say, hey, we had the supply chain issues and uh, uh, purchasing habits of, 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 of US citizens were, were changed, and you had all this volume, and it couldn't be handled, and the trains were backed up, and the terminals uh, uh, were having containers stuck there because people were picking up their cargo. I think you can put that asterisk in there and say, what came out of that? Well, some improvements in the supply chain came out of that, some more focus. There's so many different parts there. Uh, there's some uh, good focus there. And of course, I just talked to you about the ship side. We changed some queuing and there's some sh ship speed uh, adjustments as well. So I think because we have data points, it's not just to see if it, I think your question, 
uh, would be um, more challenging to answer if all we had was the first inventory of 2021, but we don't. We, we have all those data points and we can, we can see the trends in every one of these criteria pollutants and what's going on, whether it's cargo handling equipment, recreational vessels, harbor craft, ocean carriers, uh, marine terminal operators, cargo handling equipment, what ha rail, trucks, what have you. Uh, I think you'll be able to map those out. If you put this in a graph form, you'll be able to see what, what the reductions are through all of these uh, emissions inventories, the fifth one being in 2026. I think you'll map that out. If we have to circle the 2021 and say anomaly, had all the supply chain issue, out, what, what came out of that as more focus on efficiency in the supply chain. Uh, I once studied in grad school, a uh, uh, leather briefcase touched uh, 67 different entities from construction to delivery to the, you know, being bought at the store type thing. So if you just think about these, the supply chain as I just mentioned, there's so many moving parts in it. I think all of them are gonna have to do their own thing. And while the ports uh, are concentrating on terminals and, and we've got the ships and cargo handling equipment and harbor craft <coughs> and so forth, I think we'll, we'll manage that pretty well. Probably have to put it in the context of the entire picture and not just the goods movement picture uh, at that time. And I think, I think it'll be um, easy to pick out what happened in 21. It, it'll make more market reductions in 26, but you can have that whole graph. Thank you, Captain Mike. Kathy. If I heard your uh, question correctly, um, so this inventory is an important piece. It's a great technical report and it gives the specificity of each sector. Um, and if we're looking at air quality trends in the region for criteria pollutants and other, there are, we, we have air quality monitors in our region as well. So I'm, what I'm sharing is this technical port, report is important and it's one piece of other, um, other information that helps us like fill in the blanks, if, if you will, uh, between between different reports. So it's not a full gap. I've, I've got a thought on that. It's, it's a very astute question. Um, and of course, given what I do for a living, I can't say that we're setting ourselves up, you know, for failure. Otherwise, I, you know, couldn't get up tomorrow morning. Um, but in all seriousness, um, I, my sense is that um, we're at a real inflection point uh, with this work. Um, Commissioner Fellerman talked about uh, state and federal policy and how much that's been changing with the Climate Commitment Act, for example, and the Clean Fuel Standard. Um, one of the results of those state policies is that it's really changing the economics uh, of, 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 of carbon in our state and also generating revenue streams some of which is starting to flow toward some of the solutions that we're talking about here. And then federally with the um, infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, just bottom line is that we are looking at what looks like it's gonna be a fairly huge infusion of state and federal support for this kind of work that hasn't existed until now. That's gonna be super helpful. Uh, also, if you look at what's happening in the industry, um, you know, we're representing ports and Captain Mike is representing elements of the industry, but if you look at what some of the ocean carriers, Maersk and others are doing, what some of the uh, so-called beneficial cargo owners, the shippers, the Amazons of the world, um, they're setting climate goals. We're seeing a lot of movement um, in the industry that I think is positive. Um, uh, technology is developing very rapidly. Um, and then finally, um, we're putting, one thing uh, that we're trying to do at, at the ports is set the stage for um, a lot of progress out into the future. The, the, um, uh, the, the solutions I, I don't think aren't gonna, aren't gonna be uh, linear. I think what we're gonna see in the coming five to 10 years <clears throat> is kind of a leapfrogging um, in part because of the infusion of resources. And also we're, we're, what we're doing uh, in a lot of cases, and you've been hearing some examples, is trying to develop uh, platforms um, that can accelerate uh, emission reductions into the future. I'll give one example. Um, dredge trucks has come up. Um, Commissioner Ang uh, mentioned this as well. Um, we've got a huge challenge uh, on our hands there. We've got 5,000 heavy duty diesel trucks that are providing cargo hauling services in and out of our terminals in Seattle and Tacoma. As Rose mentioned, <clears throat> they're typically being purchased on a second and third hand diesel truck market for 30, 40, $50,000. Now we're saying, hey, you know what? You all have to transition to these zero emission trucks. They're 450K plus taxes, plus insurance, plus you have to, you're gonna need a charger. Uh, and um, it's gonna be a huge challenge. So what we're doing, um, and we're gonna be launching this in September, the Northwest Seaport Alliance is, is building a zero emission dredge incentive program. So collecting some of these, um, uh, collecting, uh, securing, uh, earning uh, various state and federal grants, putting it into a fund, and then we will use that fund to incentivize 
um, the trucking companies and the infrastructure developers in the region uh, to transition uh, toward uh, zero emission trucks. We, we have $50 million accumulated so far uh, for that program. With that money, we anticipate we could incentivize the deployment of about 100 and 150 zero emission trucks plus the associated charging, um, plus get at least one hydrogen fueling uh, station built in the gateway. Um, and so that's, the, that's an example of a program we're trying to build um, that we think will accelerate emission reductions, you know, out into the future. So hopefully uh, it'll, uh, you'll, you'll see some, hopefully we'll see some, in five years, actually some, some significant proce uh, progress, um, especially on the greenhouse gas emission side. That's at least what we're all working toward. Um, yes, of course, please. So it just so happens I'm carrying uh, notes from the um, June 4th uh, Seaport Alliance meeting where we got briefed on the grants program. So not only is the Biden administration, we usually hear about infrastructure being roads and bridges, right? They actually, ports are now really on the map. So I mean, well, wake up. There's, these are the hardest to decarbonize entities, ships, planes, trucks, trains. I mean, so, so all of a sudden, ports are now really squarely on the map, which never before was the case. And so it's not just unprecedented amounts of money. Like I said, the ports have then hired staff specifically to chase this money. And I will give you this uh, record of our accomplishment. It's extraordinary. So not only are there funds that were never there before, we are actually securing them. So it may take a little while before those numbers are actually um, bear out in the data, but there, you know, there's no reason but to be optimistic about the future. Other questions? Well, I was thinking about uh, what you said about industry and how it is changing, hopefully uh, electrification, they're, they're thinking about shore power and, and these things. But when I, I talked to the cruise ship companies earlier this year, one of the things that comes up that's still a challenge, just like it was with drayage trucks and other things, is that it costs a lot of money to decarbonize in, in many instances, and in, including when you plug in a cruise ship, they're going to pay more money um, for, for that power than they would if they just ran their engines. How do we incentivize them to take that a step further to the container ships? How do we get them not only to have the, sh we have the shore power, how do we get them to plug in? How will we do that? If, if before it, the industry transitions to a, a way that maybe it's, it's just easier for them to do so. So industry loves certainty and hates uncertainty. And so when this first came online down in LA Long Beach, we're looking at container ship being plugged in. You had to, you had to start developing some standards, some technology around how's that going to happen? Uh, how easy can we make that? Uh, you know, we got some vessels that come in here have a 10 hour turn. Some are two or three days. Uh, so you're going to plug in for longer or shorter, but it takes the infrastructure shore side and standardization of, of the plug-in, uh, and, then, and then they respond. So if you have more certainty about what's, what they're going to uh, see in a particular port, uh, they, they can plan around that and adapt and, and make some modifications on the ship and so forth. It, it, it's worth saying that the construction pace is really rapid right now. Vessels used to go 25, 30 years, even longer, uh, before they get scrapped and replaced. You're seeing a real rapid um, infusion of new ships. Uh, in 1992, we had 1,386 container ship calls here. Now we have just over 900. Why is that? Well, we move a lot more cargo because ships are a lot bigger. You have ship construction dynamics in play here where you get <clears throat> economy of scale leverage in addition to some more certainty about what are they going to see in their port call rotations. And they're either going to be in Asia to Europe or Asia to the West Coast, what have you. They're, they're looking at those ports saying, what, what, can I, what can I expect? And I think you're seeing really large ships being built, and then you're seeing some on the smaller end being built because you've got other ports to serve in South America and other places where you don't have the infrastructure to handle the big ships. And I think you're seeing the middle ones that used to be called mega ships are, are kind of phasing out, and you're having these really big ones that can hit the really big ports. Uh, and, of course, you guys who invest in the ports are invested in the docks to, to, to shore up uh, the underpinnings of the docks and have bigger cranes and so forth to handle all that. So I, my answer to you is uh, they want to do the right thing. Uh, they have uh, certain capital investment limitations like anybody, and they take their revenue streams that they've developed, you know, even during the supply chain crisis, and turn around and invest in right in new ship builds. And the more certainty there is a, 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 about technology development and infrastructure, the more certain they can make decisions and plan around that financially to get the return on investment to make it viable. Uh, but they've got to have more certainty about what they're going to see when they, when they uh, call in these different ports. I want to add a couple things to that, and maybe other panelists do as well. It's an excellent question and a good one. Um, <clears throat> a couple things to add. One is um, 
the statement you made actually is not necessarily true in terms of the relative cost of plugging into shore power versus burning their, their fuel. Um, I mean, it depends on, as you can imagine, many factors, you know, the price of fuel, bunker fuel versus the price of electricity. Um, uh, but, uh, for example, we're currently constructing a shore power system at, at the Husky Terminal, um, which is the busiest international cargo terminal in the Tacoma Harbor. Uh, and so we recently ran some numbers on what the relative cost will be to ships coming in, and, it, um, and that analysis shows that the cost will actually be lower to them to plug in um, than burning their fuel. So it's not necessarily the case that it's more expensive. Um, also, container ship, not cruise. Right, that's for container ships. <clears throat> um, also, and again, you know, we're all looking into our crystal balls, and yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, another thing that I'm seeing when I look at the trends that are going to affect the work that we're doing is what's happening uh, internationally with the International Maritime Organization as it relates to the, their requirements of international ships around, uh, around pollution, in particular greenhouse gases. As you can imagine, given the, climate, the global climate crisis, they're under uh, tremendous pressure, the IMO is, um, to push harder on that. Um, and I think, I mean, I'd be curious to hear what um, Captain Mike and others think, but I think we're going to ultimately see um, some kind of market-based measures globally that are going to change um, the price dynamics as it relates to what kind of fuels um, and the carbon intensity of the fuels that ships are using. Um, uh, so I think that's, and, and I, think, I think one of the reasons you're seeing all the new build activity that you're talking about, Captain Mike, is that um, I think ocean carriers are seeing that writing on the wall. So there are some international dynamics at play here as well that I think are going to help us. I'm going to interrupt again. Please. <laughs> I'm going to beat you to the punch. So two things, that one was mentioned. Um, you know, IMO is a great entity for the uniform international standards, and we may still have glaciers left by the time they regulate. Um, you know, we used to say it's moving as slow as a glacier. Glaciers are going pretty fast these days. What, what we heard before was um, it's the uh, cargo owners who are saying to the car ocean carriers, if you want to bring my box to shore, you will do it on a vessel. Because we have our own, we the cargo owners, have our own carbon emission reduction goals. So when Amazon said to Maersk, we need to you know, reduce our supply chain uh, greenhouse gases. Maersk is building you know, uh, methanol-based uh, vessels, or, and they're looking at it for multiple fuels. So it wasn't that they were waiting for IMO or they were reading, waiting for that signal. They, it was a direct market signal coming from them. There's also the role for the ports, and this is where it's uh, a little delicate. We, as a discretionary port, right, if we put down the ax and said, you can't come here unless you have X, Y, and Z, they go, well, Canada's looking better every day because they're moving, they're moving their cargo to Chicago too, and they're already beating us to the punch with cheaper rail rates and things like that. However, unlike the cargo, international cargo business, as a home port for cruise ships, which actually, you know, per vessel call is a much larger emission, uh, we're more of a, a um, mandatory stop, right? We, you know, you can either go here or Vancouver. They're both full. We can handle the bigger ships. They've got a bridge to worry about. So we can say to the cruise lines, welcome to Seattle. We do it right here. And that's what I said to the NCL president back in 2000 when the first ship call came. The fact is, if you want to use our docks, we need to meet our own standards too. And we will you know, we'll do everything we can to have the infrastructure in place. And our, our, our electricity in the Northwest is as cheap as it gets. So. But this is not something a nice to have. When we can be much more, uh, not regulatory, it's a business relationship, uh, but saying that um, when, you don't, when you're not discretionary, when you are a captive market, we have some more leverage and we're planning on using that. So anyway, I just wanted to jump in there. Can I pop in on one? I could oh, yeah. Well, I'll take a turn. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, just a bit, and this will be a little tiny bit granular, and I apologize for that. But uh, based on the comments from the EPA, which is looking at uh, more of the global aspect, not just individual ports, but all of the roads in Washington State and measuring uh, the diesel activity. And the diesel activity is generated by hauling a container that came into our ports or transformers that came in and had gone their way to Canada, what, whatever those numbers are. Well, so in the past 12 months, I've been to five different countries and all of them are working on green hydrogen generation. All of them, some of them, already have the solution and are using 18-wheel, that's our typical combination trucks, 
that we're watching going in and out here, hydrogen engines. We have a local developer, it's called, um, let's see, Piggott's uh, uh, Pack Car. So they, they've already developed and are uh, ready for the lineup and sales of um, hydrogen trucks. This is zero emission. This is water on the street. A bunch of those trucks going through here, you'd need to mop to, to pick up the water. Our issue is now, the next issue is developing green hydrogen. We've just been given a billion dollars to work on a hub uh, down in southwest Washington. And then the next big deal is to get the infrastructure so that these trucks can fuel up as they're moving their way through Washington State or wherever. Uh, it's already been studied by um, uh, the hydrogen monitors that pilot loves those kinds of trucking um, fueling stations up and down I-5 or I-90 would much prefer to be able to uh, load up a truck with hydrogen than they would to have to have this truck sitting for sometimes hours at a time, maybe, to charge up at their station. Get fill up, move the guy out of the way, let him shower, and then go on to the next truck. So it's there, as uh, Commissioner Fellman says, the future, it's... It's good. We're, we are, we're right at the threshold of being able to answer all of these uh, issues and, and make it much cleaner, much greener. Well, hello again. Um, as you can see, there's a reason why the ports are all here. Because ports are now taking on a leadership role with, when it comes to and the environment and tackling the climate crisis because we are at the nexus of the transportation industry when it comes to ships, rails, trucks. And we are the ones that uh, I think that the federal government and even our states are counting on to facilitate this particular transition. And that's why the money is being incentivized. Uh, funds are being sent to us to incentivize deployment of zero emission technology in the clean energy transition. And we have embraced this role. We've embraced this role of helping uh, transition clean energy and as being clean energy hubs. Whether that's helping secure the hydrogen hub, one out of seven, which a billion dollars will flow into the Northwest uh, for this, because uh, we'll need more energy. Uh, also, when I take a look at this, we are right now doing it voluntarily. A lot of ships, uh, ocean-going vessels, do want to plug in. Maybe it's a little different with crews, but I hear Port of Seattle has um, something up their sleeves uh, to make sure that everyone plugs in. But for us, it's not an issue. Uh, a lot of them want to plug in. It is cheaper and, and better for our communities when they do. But I must say, even with these incentives, we're very market oriented. We like community buy-in, industry buy-in, and that's how we get things done. Uh, there is such a thing that we need a legislation policy, the IMO mandates, uh, Part of the reasons why we've seen some of these uh, drastic uh, lowering of emissions is ECA emissions for ocean-going vessels. It was simply a mandate to slow down. Right now, I must say our shippers, uh, you may, uh, all of these people are and uh, carriers are doing a voluntary slowdown for the orcas right now. They're slowing down. Uh, that will be less emission, but less underwater noise. And that's actually achieved so much for our resident killer whales. And that's under the Maritime Blue Pro, uh, Quiet Sound Program. Uh, pro I don't know how much it costs them, but they're willing to do it. Uh, so I would say right now it's very values driven. The writing is on the wall uh, that we need to do something about climate and industry is all in. Now how fast that goes, that will depend on the incentives and depends on the mandate and legislation that the IMO does, our federal government, and our state government. How much, I would say, uh, they take it seriously, will pass the laws necessary, and the work that I would say our staff is doing um, here at the Seaport Alliance at the Port of Everett. I did want to also mention, in terms of ocean-going vessels, since you brought it up, uh, you know, the Port of Seattle, Tacoma, and Everett did do a visit uh, to, to Korea, one of our uh, best trading partners, I would say. And we, as uh, Rose uh, mentioned, we are part of the Green Corridors Program, a study, to see how we can facilitate. What do we need to do in terms of infrastructure, the investments, the shippers, uh, the fueling infrastructure, the bunkering? What does it take to have uh, 
to service the hybrid green methanol, green ammonia, which will be initial, and perhaps maybe even green hydrogen in the future. So we are studying that and we will be putting some infrastructure to ensure that the emissions are lowered by ocean going vessels and we're working on the trucks. So we're doing so much at the same time, but when I take a look at these um, generational investments, I kind of see it being taken into account in 2031, more than I even see it in the next five years because we are making the major investments now and we have to. And I'd rather for us to actually have, not because of a pandemic, but because we put the energy and the efforts. And I must say, we have to do this while also growing our gateway. We are ports, we are here for a reason. You know, ec economy, trade, expansion, we will have to reduce our emissions while also increasing our, our cargo increasing business. And so that is what we have to handle. And this is why I very much emphasize intense collaboration, because we are being asked by our community, by the next generation, really, to do something that has never been done, which is accelerate a clean energy transition in 20 years, really. And that will require a lot from us and monumental changes and monumental investments because we are being asked to do something that some people might even think is impossible or improbable, but we have to do it. And this is why we're all here today. So thank you. Okay, giving politicians, three politicians a microphone is dangerous, <laughs> but, um, but there is something she said that it's actually um, twofold. You know, you can talk about these enormous expenses and you can talk about how long it's going to take to implement. But as we heard, you can just pull back on the throttle and achieve incredible fuel efficiencies as well as noise reduction. And if you look at the Blue Whales Blue Skies program on the whole West Coast, they enumerate not just the fuel savings, but the, the, um, the noise reduction values as well as the likelihood of lethality of a, of a T-boning of a whale. So, so Mike Moore said, in the, in when you have the supply chain down, when you have the demand down, which it is down, China has a cold and we are all got the flu. Um, so so the, the, the ability to time the ship's arrival, to slow steam across the ocean, this has an immediate opportunity, requires no technology other than staying within the range of the ship's optimal operating condition. Uh, thank you. To all three of the commissioners, <clears throat> I think we need to bring this event to a uh, close. Um, as you can probably tell, we can talk about this stuff, you know, all day. This is our passion, um, but uh, uh, I don't think any of you want that. So I'm going to bring us to a close. I'm going to point out a couple things. Um, uh, uh, we've got some really, I think, pretty good uh, uh, one-page, two-page summaries of uh, uh, some of these emissions inventory results that are kind of at more the granular level. Uh, for example, each of the port entities. Uh, please um, feel free to, to, to grab those. Uh, also, we're all available for follow-up questions, um, uh, and um, uh, we, we welcome that. Um, but let me bring us to a close. I want to thank the panel very much. I'm going to go ahead and give them a round of applause. Um, and uh, thanks to everybody for being here.